Hello, hello, how are you? Come on, can we spend a minute thanking God today? He's a good God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, can we raise our voices to the Lord today? He's a good father. You're an ultimate father. Mm, thank you, thank you. God bless you, South Shore. We're delighted to be with you today. Uh, happy Father's Day weekend today to all the men in the house. Can we thank the Lord for them? Come on. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Special, special weekend. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you briefly about camp. Kids camp just uh, ended uh, last week. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's great. That's good stuff, too. My, uh, my son is 10. He was at camp, and uh, we were calling and saying, hey, how's camp going? And he said, Dad, he's got a little scratchy voice. He said, Dad, uh, the Lord really touched my heart. And then we said, uh, okay, well, 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 what happened? So we were driving home. We said, what happened with God touching your heart? And he said, well, we were worshiping. And he said, the Spirit of God came, and, and he, spoke, he spoke to me. I said, well, what did he say? He said that God communicated to me that in time he was going to heal me of my diagnosis of diabetes. And so uh, I just, uh, man. We're thanking God. We're thanking the Lord. He is good. It's wonderful when your kids begin to hear from, from the Lord personally. I mean, that's, that's why we do what we do. Uh, junior high camp and high school camp coming. Let me encourage you to uh, get your kids there. It could change. It could alter the course of their life. Also, one last thing, and then we'll pray and, and begin today. Uh, we had talked last week about putting 1,000 people down at the school board meeting uh, at Hillsborough County School Board meeting there on June 28th. We have altered that in light of what took place in Orlando and the, and the, the uh, tragedy that took place. We've altered that. And, and really, I got up last Thursday morning, and I felt like the Lord spoke to me. And, and he said, uh, uh, we had a pastor's gathering that day, and he said, uh, be as, as shrewd as a serpent and be as gentle as a dove. And I said, Father, what are you, you, know, what are you saying? And, and it was very clear to me at that point that no matter how much grace we went with, no matter what our message was uh, down at Hillsborough County School Board, that it would be misconstrued, that it, it would just be, uh, it would be, it would be misrepresented and misconstrued. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have strong representation. If you want to go, please feel free to go. We're going to have leaders, students. We're going we're to still speak to the school board. We really feel like that is something that's right, that we need to do. Amen. Uh, but also, we, we also want to be gracious, uh, and we want to obey the Lord. We want to hear from the Lord. Uh, and, and so there'll be another period of time, maybe in October, when we have a show of solidarity, and I'll be calling on you uh, in great numbers uh, to, to, to move forward in what God wants us to do. I wanted to bring you uh, up to speed on that and let you know, okay? So if you want to go, please, uh, please you, you can go, all right? We, we invite you to go. We're just not, the goal isn't a thousand people at the county. Amen. All right. Father, we love you. We thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for all the fathers that are in the house here at South Shore, those who are watching online somewhere around the world. We join you in what you're doing. We ask today that you would transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. amen. We're in a series called The Power of Words. The Power of of the spoken word cannot be underestimated. The words we confess are a huge part of Christianity and life itself. What we confess with our mouth, church, what comes out of our mouth is usually the predetermined uh, portion of what's in our hearts. And so what comes out of our mouth in repetition is usually a self-fulfilling prophecy. It can be very positive or it can be very negative. We want to understand who we are from who God says we are. Not from, from our past, our history, or what other people say we are. Life and death, the Bible says, are in the power of the in the power of the tongue. It's very important that we confess the right things, the right things. So here's the big idea today. And if you're brand new, I try to give the big idea of you summarize the entire message. Uh, and I adapted it a little bit from, from the teaching uh, uh, just recently, last night, if you will. And uh, here's what it is. Why not me? Come on, say it with me. Why not me? And why not now? Why not me and why not now? And, and so as we delve into this together, why, why not me? God, I, I know my resume isn't all that great. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily have all the qualifications. And, but, but why not? Why not me and, and why not now? Uh, things in your life may not be lined up perfectly. You may not have all of your ducks in a row, so to speak. But, but why not now? Why not me, God, and why not now? Turn with me in your Bibles to Judges 6. 
11 through 16. Judges 6, 11 through 16. NIV version. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under an oak in o- Oprah. I didn't know she had a, an oak, but she does. <laughs> that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So the Midianites are a vast army. They have uh, conglomerated with the Amalekites, and they face the Israelites. I know that's a lot of ites. They're facing one another, and Gideon is a deliverer. He's been assigned by God to be a deliverer for the nation, and um, he's a judge. That's why he's in the book of the Judges. And uh, he's threshing wheat to try to uh, spare some wheat and to provide food for he and his family and others who are there. The Midianites are on the verge of attacking Israel. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, church, can I, can I speak these words over you today? And this is for men in particular, but for uh, every man, woman, and child, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I, I know that on, on average days, we don't really feel like warriors, do we? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I'm, I want you to know that I'm with you, whatever your history is, whatever your background is, whatever your, uh, your resume is, whatever your situation is. I want you to know that I'm a God that's not far away. I'm a God who is near. I've come, and I want you to know I've made the announcement on this day, on this day in particular, on Father's Day, I am with you. And in another translation, it says, Hail, O mighty warrior. Do not raise your hands. How many of you feel like a valiant unconquerable warrior today? Not a lot. Not a lot. But this is what God says, and when we study the power of words, and when we understand the power of God, when we know his voice over our voice or our situation, it stirs us to be who he says we are. 13, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, Why has all this happened to us? Isn't that our answer to the Lord? Uh, God, excuse me, are you reading this press? I mean, Lord, things aren't going well in my marriage. Things aren't going well in my finance. Things aren't going well with my business. Things aren't going well with my kids. Why would you come in a situation that seems depressed and have such an escalated view of uh, of me, if you will? Um, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? Let let me go back a verse. Where are all of his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. God, I I feel so abandoned. I, uh, I feel so estranged. And he put us into the hand of Midian. Midian far outnumbers Uh, the Hebrews at this time. 14, the Lord turned to him and he said, and here's a parenting tip for all of us today. Uh, When your kids, when you tell your kids how wonderful they are and they tell you what's wrong with them, don't answer back what's wrong with them. When they say to you, but mom, I didn't make a good test score, say you're brilliant young man in the name of Jesus. When they say to you, uh, but they're taking this thing away from me or I'm getting picked on or whatever it is, let's not focus. God, if you see here, Gideon responds in the negative, God stays in the positive. God never, God never gives Gideon an excuse. Listen to me, watch this. He never gives Gideon an excuse for his circumstance or his situation or his history. He just says, this is who I say you are. This is who I declare you are. Your circumstances don't define you. Jesus, who is the Christ, does. Your circumstances, your history, they don't define you. Uh, His voice does. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Say, I've got some strength. Thank you. You're very convincing this afternoon. That's very, you, you very, I'm convinced. I mean, I, I believe you believe that. I do. I have some strength in me today. It's a little bit, but I have some. Go in the strength you have. Save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I? See, this is not about, this is not about you. Am I? This is not about you. Let, let me tell you again. This is, not, this is not about you. It's not about your pedigree. It's not about your history. history. It's not about how strong or weak you are. It's not, it's not about your family history. It's not about you. It's about him in you. It's about the Lord in you. I am am I. Have I sent you? Am I not sending you? 15. But Lord Gideon asked again, how can I save Israel? 
My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. So in, in translation, here's what he says. You've got all these clans in Israel. They're mighty warriors and people who've been trained for warfare and all this stuff. I'm in the smallest clan, and I'm the weakest son in the smallest clan. I think you've got the wrong guy. And the Lord says, oh, hail, mighty warrior. Interesting stuff. 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. You know, it's an interesting, interesting paradigm that, that we find in men, and you could be really proficient in business, and then you'd say to a man, hey, I, I'd like for you to open in prayer, and they feel very deficient in praying. Or you might find a person who is very efficient, very powerful in prayer, and then somewhere in the workforce, there is this, this gnawing deficiency that they feel. They, they feel like they don't fit in the workforce. Or maybe you've got somebody who is efficient in prayer, and I mean, they run business, and when you talk about the family, and you talk about their marriage, and you talk about their kids, and, and then there's, there's this feeling of great deficiency, like there's something, I've got it here, but man, I don't have it over here. I really, really need you. And it's very apparent in in, in a fatherless generation that we've been in, come on, in the name of Jesus, we have been maybe unfathered, but we have a great father in the name of Jesus. And we are the generation that's going to father a fatherless generation. Uh, we're going to father a fatherless generation. The, the thing about men is that somewhere in most every man's life, there's this crushing sense of doubt. Somewhere it exists. And God is coming and he's saying, I I'm not reading your resume. I I'm telling you that my power rests on you. I I'm telling you that I'm for you and I'm telling you that I'm with you and I'm telling you that when you walk with me and you understand this isn't about what you can do, you'll do great things in me, from me. You you're going to do them from me. Uh, people have, you know, I've pastored for some time now and, and I've had people say, you know, pastor in the church and whatever, and, 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 you know, have you ever wanted to quit? And I said, yes, like every Monday. <laughs> but what happens is, is that that conversation, it becomes more and more and more minimal. And anytime the enemy visits, now we are, we're, we're fulfilled with this opportunity of God in us to say to the enemy, that's not who I am. I know that's your accusation, but that's not who I am. I am in the Lord. So here's the setup in Judges 7. God says, I want you to face the Midianites, and, and uh, he's afraid. And if we admit that we're afraid, God is uh, very good to come to us and say, all right, let's talk about you being afraid. Let me help you in your fear. If we don't admit the fear, we get isolated and we get alone. And so he lays out a couple of fleeces, and you can do that with the Lord. He's kind and gracious, and, and the Lord comes through, and he says, okay, I'll face the Midianites. I'm the smallest clan, the weakest guy in the smallest clan, but I'll do it. And, uh, and so he amasses 33,000 men to face the Midianites, the Amalekites. They're a great host, a, a great army. So many, it was innumerable is what the Bible says, vast army. And the Lord comes to, uh, to Gideon, and he says to him, this is the strangest thing. He says, you have too many men to face Midian. Now, Midian outnumbers them by the hundreds of thousands. You, you've, you've got too many men. You've got 33,000 men, and you've got too many. And he, here's what he says. Because if I empower you and you face Midian with 33,000 men and you defeat them, the vast army, then somehow, some way, you're going to say, look at the great things I've done. Aren't I good? Aren't I a good strategist? Aren't I a good thinker? Isn't it, isn't it great that I've gotten to the place where um, uh, some strength and power have been exuded in me? And he says, you're going to boast that you saved yourself. Now, I want you to think about this interesting paradigm that God has with you and me. He will minimize your strength to magnify his. He'll minimize your strength in relationships to magnify his. He'll minimize your strength and your ability to pull things off that you've always been able to pull off. He'll minimize. He, and no one likes to feel minimized. Nobody does. I don't want less. I want more. I don't know. How much more is there? I don't know. Just tell me. I want it. I don't want less. I don't want less, 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 less. I want more, more, more. But we have to understand that God is setting himself up as God so that you can't set yourself up as God. And so he says, uh, say to this, this uh, group, the 33,000, any of you who are fearful, you can go home. <laughs> and 23,000 of them went back to their tents. That's, whew, they're gone, okay? 
And so there's, there's 10,000 10, that are left. And God says, uh, you know, it's again, it's strange. Again, he says, hey, Gideon, yeah, you have too many men. Yeah, but I have 10,000 men. He says, I want you to take them to the river, and I want you to sift them there. I'm going to sift them for you. And he says, he gives them this paradigm, and he says, men who go to the river, and they lap like a dog. And here's kind of the implication of this. You, you would come down and gather water like this in your hands, and you would lap, and it says like a dog. You would bring the water up to your face. You're still being vigilant. You're looking. You're a man of war, and you drink water like this. I'm going to separate those men from the men who go down to the river, get on their hands and knees, put their face to the water, not being vigilant any longer, and they drink with their face down to the water. And he says, the men who lap like a dog and stay vigilant, that's the implication, those are the ones you're going to take with you. 9,700 men got down on their knees to drink the water, and there's 300 men that are left standing there with Gideon. Oh, hail, mighty warrior. Hey, listen, good luck with that, okay? See you next week. I have 300 men. Can you, l l listen, l listen, I, I, if you write things down, this is a, a notable point here. If you're a writer, you take a note, quick note here or there. It's not how many, it's what kind. It's not how many, it's what kind. If you have a, a, a great friend, you don't have to have 10. One can make the difference. It's not how many people you have that can change the world. It just Do you recognize that under 20% of the people in all of the population of the world are the ones that change the world? It's under 20%. It's a very, it's two out of 10. It, it, some people say it's one out of 10. It could be a very small group of people, but the right person in the right place is a powerful, powerful impact. And so God says to Gideon, I want you to take your 300 men. He doesn't call them paltry, although 300 is, is a drop in the bucket compared to this large group of people. He says, I want you to go attack the Midianites at night. They're camped down in the valley. And he says, but if you're afraid, it's interesting because God addresses fear in men. We don't, he does. He says, if you're afraid, I want you to tell me that you're afraid. I want you to go down to the camp, take your assistant, and I want you to hear what they're saying about you. So he takes his assistant, and he goes down to the Midianite camp, and there are two men, coincidentally, by the order of God, who are talking about a dream one of the men had. And the man saying to another man, I had a dream, and a barley loaf rolled into the camp, and it rolled in, and it struck the tent of the camp so violently that it collapsed and fell to the ground, and there was great confusion. And the other man who heard the dream said, this is none other than Gideon, the sword of Gideon, the Hebrew who is coming to destroy the Midianites. Now, the Midianites outnumber the Hebrews, I mean, 10 to 1, 100 to 1. I mean, they're, it's incredible what the numbers are. But watch this, listen. When God tells you what to do, God's going to send his influence in front of you. When, when God tells you what to do, in other words, if God brings you to it, God will see you through it. If God's the one who brings you to the deal, God's going to seal the deal and send his angels ahead of you. We, we need not worry that our own strength is the thing that's going to get us through. And so uh, Gideon is empowered. He's strengthened because of what he's heard. He gathers his 300 men, and he gives them instruction, and he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take trumpets, which are instruments of war, aren't they, church? Uh, I want you to take your musical instrument, and I want you to put your warriors out front. I want you to make a lot of noise, okay? Take your trumpets, and I want you then to take a torch and a clay pot, and I want you to hide, hide the torch in the clay pot. We're going to sneak up on the Midianites. We're going to surround them uh, divisions of three. We're going to take three portions of the 300, and 100, 100, 100, we're going to surround this camp. And then he says, what I want you to do on my signal is I want you to blow your horns, your trumpets, as loud as you can. I want you to smash those clay pots, and I want you to raise the torches. Then I want you, in, in summer, summerly fashion, I want you to blow the trumpets again, and then I want you to shout for God and for Gideon, a sword for God and a sword for Gideon. And I want you to do it again, blow the trumpets and shout. And so what happened was God had sent a deluding spirit. It was in the middle of the watch of the night. The men were fast asleep. They blew their trumpets. They shouted a sword for God and a sword for Gideon. They broke the clay pots, raised their, their uh, uh, torches, and the men woke up in great confusion, so much so that they killed one another. Now I want to tell you this. God, God will send in our day his spirit so that the, uh, the, those who oppose the church will fight and kill one another. God, God, God will send. It doesn't matter what the number is. We're on the winning side, church.
There was great confusion, mass hysteria. They killed one another. There was great shouting and lots of, uh, uh, you know, there was breaking off of pieces. And the two kings that were represented, Midian and Amalekites, ran. They were seized by the Hebrews, and uh, they won the war. They, they won the war. And, and here's, another, here's another thing that you need to know. The battle belongs to the Lord. This is a prophetic word for somebody who's here. At, in your workplace, whatever you're facing in your workplace, this is prophetic. Whatever you're facing today that you've been unable to move, it's been, maybe it's been 10 years, and you say, oh, no, it's happening again. Oh, no, it's happening again. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle, it's not by strength and it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, thus says God Almighty. The battle belongs to the Lord. It's not something you can do. So let's talk briefly about trumpets and shouting. Trumpets are the uh, call to rally. It's the convocation. It's the men and women would be brave enough. And I, I asked a question when we started talking about the county and we started talking about uh, transgenderism and all of those things in our county. And I asked a group of guys that were standing around. I said, doesn't someone have to say something? Doesn't someone have to say something? Don't we, don't we have to speak lest we just hand over the next generation and say, do with them what you wish? Don't, don't we have to speak, church? Don't we have to? So men and women, I, I want to say this to you. Somebody, and that somebody could be you. Why not me and why not now? Doesn't somebody have to blow the trumpet so that others hear the noise of the trumpet and they pick up their trumpet and they blow the trumpet as well? It's the coming together of men and women for the right thing in God. That we just wouldn't say of our country, of our region, of our nation, of the world, of our county, of our cities, of our schools. I have nothing to do with that. I want you to know that you matter. Your voice matters. The trumpet that you carry matters because it rallies others to hear that call and to sound the same call. That's why we're here. We're to be salt and salt and light in this world. But if the salt loses its saltiness and there's no light, boy, it becomes dark pretty quickly. It becomes dark pretty quickly. I, uh, I gathered a group of pastors last Thursday, and we got together, and, and uh, me and some other folks. And uh, the man who's there who's been working in our community for 20 years said, in 20 years, I've not seen the movement, in 20 years, I've not seen the movement from the church that I've seen in the past two weeks. In the past two weeks, he's been in community issues, and, and you can clap for that. That's great. That's great. Okay, that's good. But listen, <laughs> listen to me. Pneumonia next to death is awesome. <laughs> hey, you've got pneumonia. You're not dying, <laughs> right? Now, I'm not trying to be silly, but pneumonia next to death is a good thing. It's the lesser of two evils. However, we're not talking about death. We're talking about life. What we want is life. And so what, we, what, we, what we're asking God for is for men and women to stand and to blow their trumpet. It's, it's for you. Now, I want you to say this with me. Why not me? Why not now? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, God wants to speak to you about that. Do you want to be one of the men today on Father's Day? Do you, do you want to be one of those men who cause other men to, to rally for the right thing, the good thing? I know this. I know if you're a leader, you're leading people either in your influence or in God's. I know that. Because leaders naturally lead. They, they just do. And you can lead one way or you could lead the other. I want you to remember this, though. God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God chooses the, per the person who says, I, I don't have enough. I don't know if I have enough. I don't know if I have enough time. I don't know if I have enough ability. I don't know if I know enough about God. I don't know if I know enough about the Bible. God can use that person. Because men either fall into two categories and we're either prideful and you go, I'm all that in a bag of chips, baby. This is all for you. <laughs> or... And so we fall into pride, which is arrogance, or we fall into that category of saying, you know, there's really not a lot that's meaningful in my life. And God can't use either one of those men. Why don't we come to the middle portion where we said, Jesus is the strength and power of my life. I don't have anything to offer, but I know the Spirit of God inside of me does. I know the Spirit of God does. <clears throat> Shouting at a... A sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. The gospel talks about swords in Ephesians 6, 17. It's the sword of the Spirit. Uh, Hebrews 4, 12, that it's a double-edged sword, that it's sharp and it's active. And, and it's not a sword that we hold in our hands. And men, it's not about how much we can bench press or 
uh, or, or, you know, how strong, how smart you might be, what the college you came from. Listen, the sword that's being spoken of here is the sword that comes out of the mouth. And remember, Jesus is the king of all kings, and when he returns, there's going to be a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. For it's with his words that he created the universe, and it's with his words that he confounds, that he confounds the devil, and it's with his words in your mouth that we pierce the darkness. It's, it's a sword, but it's not a sword to fight. It's a sword that declares. It's the word of God in the mouth of man, men and women. Can I get an amen? So the torches and the clay pots, or the, the torches and the clay pots, again, briefly as we speak about them, there was some time ago when we merged churches, I had a dream and I, and uh, the Lord reminded me of it. If you've been here for a while, maybe you've, you've seen me talk about this once before, but in the dream, and, and I get a little excited, I get a kind of fired up because there was a fire that started. When we talk about torches, they broke the clay pots and the torches were exposed. Now listen, we are the clay pots. The Bible, God says that he has taken his great message of salvation, he's hidden it in clay vessels, and, and the vessels are our flesh. We have this incredible light that's not ours. We didn't make it, we just let it shine. And when those clay pots are broken and we forget living for ourselves, we start living for the Lord, there's a great glory, a fire that lives in us that becomes evident to those around us. It comes out of us. And in my dream years ago, there was a great fire that started here, and it started here at the crossing, and it caused other churches and other pastors and other people and regions to light their fires, and there was consolidation. There was, there was this coming together. Do you recognize if the body of Christ ever came together in America, nothing else, the, the voices that are speaking in our country, God's voice would be raised to a level in which the nations would recognize his sovereignty. Amen. Without our voice... Not only nations don't recognize, but rulers don't recognize, and councils don't recognize, and school boards don't recognize, because what they say is, if your church, if your church is not a building, it's not a name, if your church, which is the body of Christ, if, if they don't speak, then somebody else is going to speak for, for you. If you and, and so I've heard this before, even in our own city, if the church cares, where's the church? If you care, where are you? Where are your voices? What, what, is, what is taking place? How come there's, there's a small number of people that are, that are making their voice known? And, and so in this, in this dream, the Lord reminded me um, of an old movie, The Lord of the Rings. Remember The Lord of the Rings uh, and the lighting of the beacons? I wanted you to just see this graphically for just a moment. And I, and I want you to understand that I'm not talking in global terms. I'm talking about the fire that's lit in you. I'm not talking about a church somewhere. I'm talking about you today in your heart of hearts that the clay pot might be broken and that the fire of God might rise out of your life.
I mean, it's pretty epic, you know, the, the, the music and all the stuff behind it. But, but listen to me. What if maybe, what if churches really did come together? That'd be pretty epic. What if pastors really did come together? What if, what if, what if there wasn't territorialism and fighting amongst each other? What if, you, what if you didn't separate? What if we didn't separate from each other and say, you're spirit-filled and you're not spirit-filled? What, what if we stopped the separating and we came together as one voice in the Lord? What would happen? I don't know about you, but I don't like being number one in Tampa. Here's what I mean. Tampa's number one uh, per capita in the adult entertainment industry in all of America. Per number of people. We're number one per number of people in the adult entertainment industry. That's one place I don't want to be number one. Amen? I, 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 we can do something. We really can. We really can. If we understand that we have got this light, this fire in us that is hidden in jars of clay. And I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime. I really don't. I don't know. But I'm going to live as though it were. I'm going to live as though it were. And we're going to speak as though it is. And we're going to declare those things that are not as though they are to bring them to pass. What can you do in your school? What is God calling you to do in your school? What's God calling you to do in your industry? What's God calling you to do in your business? What's God calling you to do in your home? What's God calling you to do? Say it with me. Why not me? Why not now? Why not? There was a lady that I bumped into the other day. Her husband's on fire for God, and, man, he's leading like he's never led before. And I bumped into her. I was coming out of a meeting here at the Tampa campus, and uh, she was strolling a little, a little girl in a stroller. And I said, hey, how you doing? Great family. And she said, you know, this is so-and-so introduced me to the little girl. It's a baby. You know what I mean? The baby didn't say, hi, Pastor. Anyway, I uh, I said, so what's, what is this? What's, what's, what's going on? She said, and she immediately began uh, to have tears. And she said, some time ago, it might have been six, eight months ago, you said, um, if you will allow, if you'll open your heart to God and just say to him, Father, use me any way you want to, he'll use you in ways that are unimaginable to you. He'll, he has a panoramic. He has a design and a destiny for your life. And you just open, and he does the rest. And she said, I went to the care pregnancy center, and I bumped into this mom. She has a lot of issues. And I met this little girl. And uh, I have kind of become, just by proxy, it's nothing official, kind of a surrogate mom to this mom who's a single mom and to this little baby girl. And here's what she said. I'm bringing, in tears, I'm bringing her, the mom's letting me bring her to church every week. And one day she's going to know Jesus as Savior. And through this little baby, the mom's going to know Jesus as well. And she said, I never thought at this stage in my life, her girls are, are a little bit older. Still, they still have some that are middle high, but a little older. And she said, I never thought that I had the capacity to love like this again or to put myself in a situation. But because I opened myself to it, God is filling me with the energy and the ability to love this little person and to love her mom like I've never. And she said, it's changing my life. It's changing my life. You know, uh, many of you know who Russell Wilson is. If you don't, he's an NFL quarterback. He uh, plays for the Seattle Seahawks, and throughout his entire career, somebody said, whoop, all right. When I start talking football, man, everybody gets woken up. You're awake now. So it's like <laughs> gators and other things. And I could start a war in here right now. All I got to do is make hand motions and sounds, and we'd have division. Russell, his whole life, he's 5'11", NFL quarterback. You know, lots of guys in the NFL, very tall, proto prototypical quarterback, 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 um, super smart, all, all this kind of stuff. He's 5'11", and his entire life, his entire career in football, what's been spoken over Russell Wilson is, you're too short. You're too small. You're not big enough. You don't have the acumen to read. You don't have the techniques. You don't have the speed. You don't have what it takes to be a prototypical NFL quarterback. You're, you're a game manager. And while he was about to face a very tough team in his championship game, while he was in high school, his father sat him down. He was very anxious. He was very disturbed. You know, what if we lose? What if we lose? His father said, stop talking about what's negative. He said, um, what if you don't lose? Come on, church. Come on, what if you don't lose? 
And he said, uh, I'm not the guy. Russell said, I'm not the guy. And his father said, why not you and why not now? You tell me. Russell, why not you? You too, are you going to let everybody define your life and tell you that you're too short, you're not fast enough? Are you going to let all the voices around you tell you and then define for you, or are you going to go out of that field and you're going to define for yourself who you are because you have what it takes? Why not you and why not now? I, I just want to read to you a few of the things that Russell has accomplished in, in the NFL where the biggest men in the world live. He's an NFL Rookie of the Year, two-time NFC champion, three-time Pro Bowler, Pro Bowl Offensive MVP, most valuable player, and a Super Bowl champion. In 2013, he was one play away from winning a Super Bowl in 15. <laughs> Pretty good for a little scrawny guy. I mean, you know, and you know, you recognize I'm saying it like this. Pretty good for a guy that everybody wrote off. I want to tell you something. Don't write yourself off because God hasn't. Why not me? Come on, say it with me. Why not now? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you've given us this great opportunity to see the power of your words over our lives. And I pray for the men and women who are here, the young men and women that uh, the definition, the very definition of life, the light that lives in us would come from your life. And we thank you now that we receive. How many of you here today, here at South Shore, just by raising of hands, and, and really I want you to consider these things. I don't want you to get into them rotely. How many of you are, <clears throat> are committed to listening and learning, understanding, believing, receiving who God says you are alone? Would you raise your hand with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you break down every lie, every curse, every fatherless thing. I, we speak a father's voice over every man, over every woman, over every child. And God, where there's been lack and decrease, where there's been brokenness, we say, God, that there would be a multiplication, there would be abundance, there would be grace. And it's not haphazard, it's, just not, it's not weak and flimsy. I pray your spirit on every one of us to know who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now we want to confess Christ as Savior. Every voice down at South Shore as well, would you say this with me? Lord Jesus. Come on, church, would you find a little place to sit up a little bit? Come on, we're speaking to the King. Lord Jesus, I call on you today. I give you my life. Take my sin. Take my shame. Fill me with grace. I receive your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, we can thank him. We can thank him. We can thank him. He's a good father. How many of you today, right in that, in that spirit that we're in right here at South Shore, wherever you are, on the count of three, you prayed that way for the very first time. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. You're saying, Jesus, I gave my life to Christ. I see you, sir. I see you, sir. I see you, ma'am. I gave my life to the Lord today. How many of you? In the balcony, the bleachers. Come on, we can thank God more. In the balcony, the bleachers, I see you. Who else? Amen. Anybody else today? One last time. Anybody else? I don't want, that's the greatest thing in all the world is to say, Jesus, I'm, I'm leaving. You know you can't go with God and stay where you are at the same time, right? God, I'm leaving where I was. I'm coming with you. I'm going to let you define me. Amen. Now, if you trusted Christ, you're going to see in the seat back behind you, everybody look in the seat back right behind you, there's a little card, pull that card out. Uh, we encourage you just to fill that card out, and then when we get done worshiping in just a moment, you're going to be dismissed, you're going to be going out through the lobby, and then just as you get out the doors, you're going to see a tent that says, today I decided, hand that card in, and we have a wonderful, wonderful gift for you. We want you to get started in the Lord the right, right way. Amen? All right, why don't we stand today? Prayer partners, you come forward. We're going to worship for just a moment. If you need prayer for anything in the world, we invite you to come. We invite you to come. A short time ago, it might have been four weeks ago, I had a testimony of a man who was in the lobby, and he had a, a growth. He said it was cancerous. It was growing in his neck, and it was growing very large, like the size of a large grapefruit. 
and he came forward to pray. And uh, the lady that prayed for him said, I had a special grace to pray for him. And I said over his life, I believe God's healing this right now. And sometimes when you pray, there's a grace that leads you. Remember when Jesus was walking and uh, the lady grabbed his cloak and he said, what has gone from me? There's a special impartation. And he said, I, I received it. I just, okay. And uh, <laughs> he said, I think something happened. And she said, of course something happened. God is moving. Yeah, how many of you believe God still heals? He's, he heals. So a week later, he came to service. No, it was gone. And the wife, the wife, wait, 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 just a second. I don't want you to clap. Just hold on and listen. The wife, so the wife is standing next to him, and she says, after we prayed, I went to church. I mean, after we, we left church, I went home. We, we took a nap. We got up, and she said it started shrinking. I saw it on Sunday afternoon. It started going down. And she said, I stayed up most of the night, and I watched this thing that was sticking out to here completely disappear. So when I saw him, when I saw him that following week, he was like, it's gone. He was like, and he was like, what? I'm like, the Lord. I mean, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. God bless you and happy Father's Day. Listen. We're, we're not finished just yet. We're just a couple more minutes to worship, and then Pastor Michael's going to dismiss us. God bless you.